I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. Now, I want us to look tonight at verses 9 through 15. The title of my message is, The Savior Who is God. I want to begin by reading these verses, and our focus this evening is upon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who he is, and what he did. Colossians chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse 9. The Bible reads, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile in mind. And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. The cornerstone of Christianity is Jesus Christ. And the cornerstone of Jesus Christ is His full, perfect, absolute, infinite deity. It is the full deity of Christ that separates Him from every other religion and false cult. Other religions merely assign Jesus a place in their thinking. They simply see him as a great man, but no more. Or they acknowledge him as having some spark of deity in him, but that is all. They ascribe to him to be a good example, a moral teacher, a gifted leader, to be studied, and no more. But the Bible declares in no uncertain terms that Jesus Christ is fully God in human flesh. The Scriptures teach with unmistakable clarity that Jesus Christ is very God, fully God. This is the cornerstone upon which Christianity rests, and it affects all that Jesus did. Jesus had to be what He was, fully God, in order to do what He did, perfectly accomplish our salvation. Jesus had to be fully God in human flesh in order to save us. In the verses before us in Colossians 2, we have one of the clearest statements in all of the Bible of the full deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Along with it, we have the glorious account of what Jesus did for us as God on our behalf. Martin Luther, Martin Luther once reasoned, quote, For what good would the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus do me if he were merely a man such as you and I are? Close quote. The answer is, the suffering and death of Christ would have been to no avail if He were merely a man such as you and I. But He was more than a carpenter. Jesus Christ was fully God in order to save us from our sins. In these verses tonight that I want us to survey... There are two main headings. I want you to see two things. Number one, who He is, and number two, what He did. I want you to see who Jesus is, that is, the person of Christ. 
And secondly, I want you to see what Jesus did. That is the work of Christ. Who he is, what he did. The person and work of Christ. I want you to note first who Jesus is because everything that he did for us rests upon this chief cornerstone of his divine being. I want you to note verse 9 and the end of verse 10 and I want you to tell me who Jesus is. I will tell you who Jesus is because Paul has told us who Jesus is. In fact, God the Father has told us in unmistakable terms. Note verse 9. For in Him. The Him refers to Jesus Christ. You'll note the end of verse 8. The last word is Christ. And in Him. In Christ. Please note this unmistakable statement. May every person in a false religion stand in awe of this statement. May everyone who is entangled in a false cult be in shock and astonishment and amazement at this clear testimony. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. When it says all the fullness of deity, Paul is writing to declare that all the divine attributes are in Christ, all the divine nature is in Christ, the full deity of God the Father is shared equally with God the Son who took upon Himself bodily form. This clearly says that Jesus Christ is fully God and yet fully man. He is 100% God and 100% man. That is who Jesus is. Jesus existed long before his incarnation. In fact, there has never been a time in eternity past when Jesus Christ did not exist. He is the eternal Son of God, the creator of all that there is, yet he himself is uncreated by anyone or anything. Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead, co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And it was in the fullness of time that this person, fully God, entered into the human race through the womb of a virgin and was born of a woman under the law and yet without a sin nature. That is what this says. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. We affirm, we assert, we declare without any equivocation the absolute, full, infinite deity of Jesus Christ. He is as fully God as the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now... Jesus Christ is fully God, as it is clearly said in this text of Scripture. It is indisputable. It is undeniable. But let me give you just some quick headings to expand our thought on why we believe in the deity of Christ. And number one, we do so because Jesus performed the works that only God can perform. Jesus has created everything out of nothing. Jesus Christ is the one who alone can forgive sin. Jesus Christ raises the dead. Jesus Christ is the final judge on the last day of heaven and earth. Jesus performs the works that no mere man can perform. Jesus Christ performs that which only God performs. Secondly, Jesus is worshipped as God. Uh, there are numerous times in the Scripture when Jesus is declared to be God by those who worship Him. In John chapter 20, Thomas, on the Sunday after the resurrection, appears. He is in the upper room, and Jesus appears, and Thomas falls down before the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, My Lord and my God. 
the Lord Jesus received that worship. He did not rebuke him at all because Thomas understood exactly who Jesus Christ is. Behold Christ in heaven in Revelation chapter 5 with myriads and myriads around the throne of God and all declaring the, the worship that belongs to the Father and to the Son. Third, Jesus Christ possesses the attributes that only God possesses. Jesus is holy. Jesus is sovereign. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He is so holy that even the demons themselves cry out, You are the Holy One. He is absolutely righteous. He is perfect love filled with divine compassion. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He possesses the attributes, the, the, the character qualities that belong exclusively to God. And Jesus possesses the names that are assigned to God alone. Just to give you one, seven times in the Gospel of John... Jesus takes the name, I am who I am, and assigns it to himself and says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Jesus declares himself to be God by taking the titles and the names of deity and taking them to himself. And finally, Jesus is equated with God in many passages. Just one to give you. In the Great Commission, it is said, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Many other passages to which we could turn tonight, but time does not permit. But it is indis the indisputable testimony of the Word of God that Jesus Christ is God, that He, in Him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Note the end of verse 10 as we continue to think about who Jesus is. And he is head over all rule and authority. And that Jesus Christ is head means that he is the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth and that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the supreme ruler of all that there is in the universe. He is the supreme ruler of the devil, of all the demons of hell, of all the angelic being, of all those who are saved, of all those who are lost, all those who are already damned in the pits of hell itself, Jesus Christ is head over all. And when it says over all rule and authority, the reference is to angelic beings. This is who Jesus is. There is no identity crisis in the Bible concerning who Jesus is, and there is none in this church tonight or on any night because we understand who Jesus is. Before I move on, let us be rock certain and crystal clear regarding the full undisputed deity of Christ. We owe Him our worship. We owe Him our loyalty. We owe Him our allegiance. We owe Him our obedience. We owe Him our love with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. We owe Him our very lives. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, which is to go and be with Christ. He is the one who directs our steps. He is the one who has laid out the path before us. He is the one who has been raised from the dead and who shall raise us from the dead on the last day. He is the one who is preparing a place for us in heaven. He is the very centerpiece of heaven throughout all of the ages to come. The angels bow down and worship Him. 
All the saints of God worship Him. All glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is who Jesus is. Now, I want you to note from this passage, secondly, what Jesus has done. We have considered the person of Christ. He is fully God in human flesh. But please note with me the work of Christ on our behalf. What He has done for us. And the way I want to lay this out for you, I want your eye to look at your Bible at verses 9 through 15. And if you have a pen with you, you may want to underline these prepositional phrases. I've drawn a circle around them in my Bible. In verse 10, in Him. Do you see it? In verse 11, in Him. In verse 12, with Him. And then again in verse 12, with Him. In verse 13, with Him. And finally, at the end of verse 15, through Him. Six prepositional phrases. In Him, in Him, with Him, with Him, with Him, through Him. Each one of those six prepositional phrases will lead us to understand what He has done for us as God through His sin-bearing, substitutionary death. Let's look at the first. In verse 10, what Christ has done, He has made us complete. Look at verse 10. And in Him. There's no question who the Him is. It refers back to the antecedent at the end of verse 8, to Christ, in Him, in Christ, you have been made complete. Only one who is fully God could make us fully complete. If He were less than God, then the salvation that would be granted to us would be less than complete. I want to say it again. Only one who is fully God could give to us a salvation that makes us fully complete. Now, what does this mean that He has made us fully complete? Two things. Number one, positionally. In Christ, we are made to be the perfect imputed righteousness of His own active obedience. Jesus Christ was born under the law He kept with perfect obedience every jot, every tittle, every detail of the Mosaic law recorded in the Old Testament, and it is His perfect active obedience to the law of God that is charged to our account when we believe upon Jesus Christ by faith. In this sense, He has made us complete before God. He presents us faultless to stand before the throne of grace. We are robed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ through His full and perfect obedience to the law of God. And the final step of that obedience was His passive obedience as He laid down His life upon the cross in obedience to God the Father. This is the first sense in which we've been made complete. And I trust that tonight you understand that as God looks at you, that what God sees is the robes of the perfect righteousness of Christ that has dressed you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet and has made a perfect covering over all of your sins. That as God looks down from heaven tonight... For those who have believed upon Jesus Christ, all of our sin is covered by the robes of His perfect righteousness that have clothed us through justification by faith. Now, second, it also speaks practically that we have been made complete. In this sense, God has given to us everything that we need to live the abundant Christian life, and to live it victoriously. 
He has given to us a new heart and a new mind and a new disposition. He has given to us His Holy Spirit who has come to indwell us. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We are a new creature in Christ Jesus and we are indwelt by the sovereign Holy Spirit of God who has omnipotence and has fullness of heaven's resources to bestow to us as we live the Christian life such that there is absolutely nothing lacking that is needed by us to live a dynamic Christian life. You could take a Christian and seal him up in a Roman prison cell, put him in solitary confinement, separate him even from other believers, and the resources that he has in Christ, he is still yet able to live triumphantly, victoriously, and to be an overcomer in the midst of the most difficult circumstances of life. He has made us complete. We're not looking for a second blessing. We already have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Only one who is fully God can make us fully complete this very moment. And whatever inadequacies there are in my Christian life, lie with me, not with Him and what He has provided. Now second, we have seen in verse 10 that He has made us complete. Now second, I want you to note in verse 11, He has circumcised us. This one who is fully God in human flesh has worked upon our hearts. Verse 11 says, and in Him. This second prepositional phrase, in Him, signals us that there, we're moving on now to another aspect of this great salvation that has been lavished upon us. Verse 11, and in Him you were also, pointing back to the time of our conversion, and you refers to every believer, not just in Colossae, but in every age and every place. It's true of all of us here tonight. And in Him you were also circumcised. Now you may say, I didn't know that I'd been circumcised. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh. This is a spiritual circumcision. Now, what is circumcision? Circumcision is a sharp, penetrating cut of the foreskin of the male organ that signifies that he is to be set apart unto God. In no way did circumcision save anyone any more than baptism saves in this age. But this circumcision, in verse 11, is not referring to a physical circumcision. It is referring to a spiritual circumcision. That Jesus Christ, the one who is fully God, has cut and penetrated into our hearts. And He has sovereignly initiated this surgical procedure in our hearts, and it is the new birth. It is regeneration. It is being a new creature in Christ. And by this surgical cut, He reaches down into our soul, and He takes out our old heart of stone. And while our heart is laid open on the operating table, He puts down within us a new heart of flesh. A new heart that has a spiritual heartbeat, that has a spiritual heart, a pulse, 
that has a passion and affection for spiritual things, that is a heart that is alive unto God. Previously, we were dead in our trespasses and sin, and now He gives us a new heart in Christ. Only one who is fully God can so cut into our soul and take out our old heart of stone and perform open heart surgery and give to us a heart of flesh and then seal us up by His Spirit and breathe new life into us. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. We are new creatures in Christ. We are new people. We have, we have thrown off the old man, and the new man has come. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, third, because I want to keep pressing on through this text. Number one, He made us complete, verse 10. Number two, He has circumcised us. That is verse 11. Now, in verse 12, I want you to see He has buried us with Him. Note the next prepositional phrase in verse 12. It is with Him. Having been buried with Him in baptism. Please note the verb tenses. This is in the past. This looks back to the time of our conversion. You and I were buried. And the, the, the indication, the picture of this metaphor is that our old life was buried and we are no longer the man that we once were. That is behind us. That is under us. That has been buried and we have been buried with Him because by faith we are united with Christ and when He died upon that cross, we died with Him. And when He was buried, we were buried with Him. And as we will see in a moment, when He was raised from the dead, we were raised with Him. That is how identified we are to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this baptism in verse 12 having been buried with Him in baptism, does not speak of water baptism. It speaks of spirit baptism. There's not a drop of water in chapter 12. Sometimes some of you ask me, how is it that Presbyterians and Methodists come to sprinkle infants? What is their passage? What is their text? I, I receive emails almost on a weekly basis from people I don't even know around the country and around the world asking me why I do not believe in infant baptism and why I believe in believer's baptism. And those who believe in infant baptism equate circumcision with water baptism. And just as infants were circumcised in the Old Testament, and they point to this passage, and this is the only passage that even remotely begins to talk about this, they equate now water baptism of infants with the circumcision of infants. A couple things to say about that. Number one, this isn't even talking about water baptism. This is talking about spirit baptism. And number two, there is not a verse in the entire Bible in which any infant has ever been baptized. It is an entire case of smoke and mirrors. It is an entire case presented on logic and drawing conclusions. But the only problem is there is not one shred of of evidence. Not one single verse in the Bible, not one half of one verse in the Bible where any infant has ever been dipped, sprinkled, immersed, anything. What this text is saying is that we have been buried with Christ in baptism. It'd be impossible for us to be buried with Christ with water baptism. 
The only way we could ever be identified with Christ in His burial is by a sovereign, supernatural work, not of water, but of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God. And that is precisely what this is teaching. Now, the point of this in verse 12, at the beginning of this, not only have we been made complete, and not only have we been circumcised by Christ, but our old life has been buried. Every one of us, our, our biography can be written in two volumes. You may wish for more volumes, but there's only two volumes. Your life before Christ and your life since Christ. And that's all that there is. Your B.C. days before Christ, and when you were converted to Christ, you closed the book on volume one, and that is all behind you, and God has buried that book, and He has buried your old life, and He has buried your sins, and that is all behind us, and we have now begun a brand new volume with a brand new start with a clean slate, and it is a slate that will remain clean throughout all of the ages to come. We, the burial of Christ is important. Uh, I received uh, an email a couple of days ago, someone asking me about cremation, and what does the Bible have to say about cremation, and can a believer be, be, be cremated? And I, and I said that there's really no teaching in the Scripture on this subject. There are two people in the Old Testament, uh, Saul and Jonathan, who were, who were cremated. That my, my understanding is most people want to be cremated simply out of a fear of death and don't want to stand before God on the last day. And, and, and in some way, in their mind, they can just remove any sense of accountability before a holy God in heaven, or they simply don't have the resources to be put into the dirt. But the burial of Christ, I said in this email, is vitally important because the burial of Jesus Christ is vitally important. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, three hallmarks of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are identified with all three. Not two out of the three, but all three. We have died with Christ. We've been buried with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. And that we've died with Christ means we're dead to our old way of life. That we're buried with Christ means that that, that old life is over. It is done with. It is ancient history. It is past tense. It has been buried. And we have been raised with Christ means that there is a brand new life. A brand new life unlike anything we ever experienced beforehand has now entered into our existence. You know what the, 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 word, the words eternal life mean? It means life of the ages to come. And we receive eternal life the moment we are converted to Christ. John 5 verse 24 makes this abundantly clear. And what we experience in the new birth is unlike anything we have ever known, unlike anything we had ever tasted of, unlike anything we have ever experienced before, it is a life not of this world. It is a life that has come down out of heaven and has filled our souls. The burial of Christ is important to the gospel, and our burial is important to our salvation. But I, I must hasten. In verse 12, there is another prepositional phrase. Notice, not only have we been buried with Him, but we have also been raised up with Him. This refers not to a physical resurrection, although we will have one one day if Christ has not come in our own lifetime, but it refers to a spiritual resurrection that is another picture of our conversion, of our new birth. 
that we have been raised from the dead. Now, this presupposes that we were spiritually dead if there is to be a spiritual resurrection. And he will go on to tell us about that. But we have been buried with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. And let me tell you again, the thread that's running through this. Only one who is fully God could raise us from the dead. Do you know anyone, any of your neighbors raising people from the dead? Anybody down at work raising people from the dead? Anyone you went to school with? Anyone tell you at your high school reunion, oh, by the way, I, I've been raising people from the dead? Only God can raise from the dead. I am the resurrection and the life. He alone has authority over death and over the grave. And He alone has authority to raise us up with Him. And that's what verse 12 says. So that's the fourth blessing of our salvation. That only Jesus, who is fully God, can accomplish in our lives. He's made us complete, verse 10. He has circumcised us, verse 11. He has buried us with Him, verse 12. He has raised us with Him, verse 12. And I want to give you two more. Number five, He has made us alive with Him, verse 13. Notice in the middle of verse 13, this fifth prepositional phrase, with Him. This is one more hook for us to hang our thoughts on and that Paul is hanging these glorious truths on that we have been made alive with Him. Now, notice how verse 13 begins. Remember I just said the fact that He has raised us means we had to have been dead to begin with. And that is precisely what he tells us here. He says in verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions... Now stop right there. The you refers to all believers. Whether you were raised in the church or raised out of the church, whether you were raised in a Christian family or whether you were raised in a pagan family, whether you were close to the truth or whether you were a long ways away from the truth, whether you lived a rebellious lifestyle of open, propagate sin or whether you just simply had the sin of self-righteousness. Every one of us came into this world dead in our transgressions. We had no spiritual life. There was no spiritual pulse. We were cut off from the life of God. We were devoid of life. There was an empty void, an empty vacuum within us. And being dead in our transgressions, we were unable to respond to spiritual stimuli. We had no moral ability inherent within us to respond to God and to the gospel. We were spiritually helpless and we were spiritually hopeless in this state. When you were dead in your transgressions, and note, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. The word flesh there refers not to our physical flesh, but to the flesh of our inner person. As Paul uses the term in Galatians 5, carnality, and walking according to the flesh. Our flesh was uncircumcised. Our flesh was uncrucified. Our flesh did what it wanted, when it wanted, with whom it wanted, it went its own way. We were dead in our transgressions. In verse 13, He, referring to God the Father, made you alive together with Him, referring to God the Son. This was all God's initiative. This was God exerting the power of life to raise us from the grave of sin and to unite us with His Son the God who said, let there be light, 
is the God who looked at your dead soul and said, let there be life. And there was created in you eternal life, spiritual life, that only God can give, and it came by divine initiative. And when God did, He made us alive together with Christ. And the life that was given to us was the very life of Christ Himself. He who is the life, He who is the giver of all life, is the one who, who, who has shared His life with us. I want to say it again. Only one who is fully God in human flesh could give us life. Uh, someone else may give me a meal. Someone else may, may give me a pat on the back. Someone else may give me something of this world, but only one who is fully God can give me life. Now, notice he goes on to say, having forgiven us all our transgressions. I know we've talked about this many times. And it's almost hard for me to come up with something new to say that you have not heard me say or that you have not read on your own in your own Bible study and in your reading of other Christian books. But just let this sink back into your cranium one more time. That we have been forgiven all our transgressions, every single one of them. The ones you remember, the ones you have forgotten, the ones that you have not yet committed, the ones that you committed before becoming a Christian, the ones that you have committed since becoming a Christian, those sins of omission, those sins of commission, those sins in which you did what you should not have done, those sins in which you did not do what you should have done, every sin that you have ever committed, and when they're all grouped together, it makes a mountain that reaches up to the heights of heaven itself, you and I would probably go insane if we could call to mind every wicked thought and every wicked deed that you and I have ever committed in the entirety of our life, and it would be no glory to God for us to resurrect those dead sins that have been buried in the sea of His forgetfulness. But what we need to be reminded of tonight is that He has forgiven us every one of those sins. And He has done it through Jesus Christ our Lord. This word forgiveness comes from a root word that means to send away. And what the Lord Jesus has done is He has commanded by His sovereign authority to send away the pollution and the guilt and the penalty of every stinking one of our foul sins. Through His one death, every sin has been wiped away through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, only one who is fully God in human flesh, hanging upon that cross, bearing the curse of our sins and iniquities, would have the authority to command your sin and my sin to be gone. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. He has the authority to take our sins and place them behind God's back. He alone has the authority to take our sins and to bury them in the sea of God's forgetfulness and for God to say, their sins and iniquities I remember no more. Only one who is fully God can fully deal with our sins. And verse 14 opens this up. Time does not permit to, 
to do the word studies and to give the historical background that I would like. If you have a study Bible, you can read for yourself at the bottom of the page. But it says, in granting this forgiveness, he has canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us. The imagery of this, the metaphor of this, is that God has a certificate of debt by which He has recorded every sin we have ever committed, are committing, and will ever commit in the future, and they are hostile to us, they condemn us, they would consign us to hell. But Jesus has taken that certificate of debt that lists every single one of our sins and he has canceled out that certificate of debt by his shed blood. He has paid in full the entirety of the debt that we owe to God because of our sins. And this is how God has done it. Verse 14, he has taken it out of the way. He has totally reversed it. He has erased it. He has removed it. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You remember when Jesus was lifted up to die upon the cross, that on the placard above the cross, it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews? That was not to identify Him as a person. That was the crime against Him. That was the charge, the charge of blasphemy that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. In this very same imagery, it was the certificate of debt, which is, are the crimes that we have committed against God. It is as though they were nailed to the cross, and it read more than just Jesus, king of the Jews. On that placard was every one of your sins, every one of my sins, the sins of everyone who would ever believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Father nailed it to the cross. And through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, He wiped it out. He paid in full our sin debt. Only one who is fully God in human flesh, hanging upon that cross on Golgotha could totally cancel out and take away the whole record of our sins. No mere teacher could do that. No mere life coach could do that. No mere ancient guru could do that. No mere prophet could do that. No mere priest could do that. No mere religious leader could do that. Only eternal God come into this world in human flesh with undiminished deity, with undiminished power to die upon that cross and to make the perfect blood atonement for our sins. Now there's one last thing that I want you to see. There's one last prepositional phrase. It's at the end of verse 15. And it is through Him. Do you see that? Not only has He made us alive with Him, verses 13 and 14, but finally, number six, He has routed our enemies. Notice verse 15. When he, referring to God the Father, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 12, If I be lifted up, the prince of this world will be cast down. It was through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ that He crushed the head of the serpent. Genesis 3.15 said that this serpent would bruise the heel of Christ upon the cross, 
but Jesus, through his death, would crush the skull and the head of the devil. It is metaphorical language to communicate to us the overwhelming, triumphant victory over all of the forces of darkness that Jesus secured through his death. When it says he disarmed the rulers and authorities, it means that he, may, that he stripped them and shamed them at the cross. He made a public display of them. That the idea here is he made an open spectacle. He publicly humiliated the devil. He publicly humiliated all of the demonic forces of darkness with his triumphant victory at the cross. The whole picture here is of the triumphant Roman procession, a Roman general returning from battle and coming back to Rome, and the whole empire, as it were, turning out to see this returning general coming back from the battlefield. And he has his own soldiers behind him and pulling up in the rear, being drugged by their chariots, their faces in the dirt are all of the conquered enemies who would oppose the Roman Empire. It was a glorious scene in Rome for all of its citizens. And the idea was to publicly shame and to publicly humiliate as much as they possibly could and to rub the face and the noses of their enemies into the dirt in a public display as much as they possibly could. That is the historical background in verse 15. That upon that cross, we see it with physical eyes. We see Jesus dying alone, bearing a crown of thorns, the placard reading, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, the blood flowing. We see him having to raise up in order to exhale and then to receive more air into his lungs. We see him struggling upon that cross. We see the sun being blacked out, our sins being transferred to Christ, the Father forsaking the Son as he became sin for us, we hear Christ cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But when we see that scene with spiritual eyes, when we behold Calvary with the eyes of faith and an open Bible before us, we see that Jesus was no victim, but that he was the victor of the ages. We see that he was triumphant over our sins, and that he routed the forces of darkness and he wielded such a blow to the devil such as he will never recover from. And the day is coming at his second coming when he will bring to full execution all of his triumph that was achieved through his death upon Calvary's cross. Only one who is fully God could crush not only the devil himself, but all of the demonic spirits and all of the hordes of hell, and all of the rulers and authorities and principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Through that one death, the Lord Jesus Christ won the victory for you and for me. And there will never be anyone else but Christ who will rule and reign forever. Only one who is fully God in human flesh could make us fully complete, could circumcise us, could cause us to be buried with him, raised with him, make us alive with him, forgive us of our sins, 
and rout all of our enemies. This is who he is, and this is what he has done. This is the person of Christ. This is the work of Christ. This is one who is fully God in human flesh, and this is one who alone could provide such an overwhelming victory for us at the cross. As we come to the Lord's table tonight, let us have our minds renewed. Let us have our hearts renewed. Let us have our wills renewed because of the great victory of Christ. Let us pray. Father, we stand in absolute amazement. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. We could have never designed nor dreamed up this extraordinary plan of salvation if you gave to us the next 10,000 years and an infinite number of blank pieces of paper and pens and paper and computers and all the rest. It would have never entered our minds that you would have sent your only begotten Son to be born of a virgin, to enter the human race and be fully God yet fully man and die for us upon the cross. Father, even tonight as we have reminded ourselves of the spoils of his victory at the cross, cause our hearts to treasure and to cherish and to glory in the finished work of Christ at the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.